bless you, Lord, you are holy. And forever you are God. We bless you, Lord, you are holy. Yes. And forever you are God. We bless you, Lord, you are holy, and forever you are God. We bless you, Lord, you are holy, and forever you are God. Hey. We bless you, Lord, you are holy, and forever you are God. We bless you, Lord, you are holy, and forever you are God. Hey. I bless you, Lord, you are holy, and forever you are God, you remain the same. We bless you, Lord, you are holy, and forever you are God. Hey. Hallelujah to a God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah to a God. Hey. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. To a God, we bless you, Lord. You are holy, and forever you are God. We bless you, Lord. You are holy, and forever you are God. Hallelujah, hallelujah to a God, hallelujah, hallelujah to a God, you greater 
than yours. Hey, yes, you are. When we call you, you will answer. Yes, you are. When we call you, you deliver. There's no name, no name greater than yours. There's no name, no name higher than yours. There's no name, no There's no name, no name more potent than yours. Hey, there's no name, no name greater than yours. There's no name, no name. Reliable than yours, Jesus. Hey, there's no name, no name bigger than yours. Hey, there's no name, no name greater than yours. Yes, you are. When we call you, you will answer. Hey, yes, you are. When we call you, you deliver. There's no name, no name. Greater than yours. Hey, there's no name, no name bigger than yours. There's no name, no name greater than yours. There's no name, no name greater than yours. Hey, there's no name, no name greater than yours. Yeah, you are. When we call you, you will answer. Yes, you are. When we call you, you deliver. There's no name, no name greater than yours. There's no name, no name reliable than yours. More reliable, more potent than yours, Jesus. There's no name, no name greater than yours. Hallelujah. Good evening. It's a great privilege to be back with you in God's presence this Lord's Day. 
I trust that the light of God has been done on you all through this fast. And I pray that in the name of the Lord Jesus, the seeds being sown into your spirits by this fast and by these teachings will bear fruit in the name of Jesus. I pray that this month will be a month of crossing lines in the name of the Lord Jesus. It will be a month indeed of exceeding glory for you in Jesus' precious name. I want to thank you so much for joining us this evening. Hallelujah. I'm going to be reading our anchor scripture from 2 Corinthians 3, verse 7 to verse 11, and then we will work. The Bible says, But if the ministry of death, written and engraved on stones, was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not look steadfastly at the face of Moses because of the glory of his countenance, which glory was passing away, how will the ministration of the Spirit not be more glorious. For if the ministry of condemnation had glory, the ministry of righteousness exceeds much more in glory. For even what had was what made glorious had no glory in this respect because of the glory that excels. For if what is passing away was glorious, what remains is much more glorious. Let us pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we ask for your help in delivering your word. Help me to come forth to, to these people this evening in the wisdom and the power of Elijah. Help me turn the disobedience to the wisdom of the just. Help us make ready a people for the Lord. Lord, use these scriptures to paint vivid pictures in the consciousness of your people that they will not recover from as long as they live. We give you thanks and praise. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. If you're not tired of listening to me for about three days now, so we've been talking about the exceeding glory of God and how that in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 7, verse 11, the Bible calls the present dispensation of glory we are in, the dispensation of the excelling glory, the dispensation of the glory that excels, the dispensation of the glory that excels. Because what that means basically is that no matter what happened in the Old Testament, we are living in the dispensation where every record set in the Old Testament will be bested by those of us who live under the new covenant, under the ministration of righteousness and the ministration of the Holy Ghost. So please, as you study the Old Testament, don't look at them as it were, as people you want to measure up to. Look at everything that happened in their life and ministry, in their families, as things you should exceed. Because the Bible tells us that the glory that excels is here. I pray that in Jesus' mighty name, that excelling glory will be your portion in Jesus' precious name. If it is God's plan, therefore, for us to excel in glory, what is that factor that cuts short the glory of man? In Romans 3, verse 23, the Bible says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So we see that the agency that brought about a reduction in the glory that God had ordained for man was sin. Sin, therefore, is a glory stealer. Sin is a glory stealer. And it's important, therefore, if you want to be glorious, you have to begin to pay attention to how to gain victory and mastery over sin in whatever form it chooses to come. Hallelujah. In whatever form it chooses to come. Look at what Jesus said about sin. In John chapter 8, verse 46, Jesus said, and I quote, Which one of you convinces me of sin? I'm praying that in the name of the Lord Jesus, we will begin to build our integrity, our righteousness, our purity, 
to the point where we can say publicly, which one of you, are you there, convinces me of sin. May we get there in the name of the Lord Jesus. And I have said in each of these services, the reason why the glory of God at work in the life of Jesus Christ was boundless was because his life was sinless. Of course, glory comes with so many other things. I dare say everything you are gunning for in life is represented in the glory. If you are saying you are trusting God for needs met, it's represented in the glory. Philippians 4 verse 19. If you are saying you are trusting God for defense, is represented in the glory. Isaiah chapter 4 verse 5. You are no matter what the need, the glory of God is the consummate fulfillment of everything man can ever need or more and more. So we see the man fell short because of sin. In John 14 verse 30, Jesus said, Hereafter, I won't talk much with you because the prince of this world comes and has nothing in me. Therefore, you see that at different times, the prince of this world will come to us and the outcome of our lives will function of what he has in us. If there is his chip in us, then he can control, if not in some cases, defeat us. This is why we have to begin to empty ourselves of every single thing that belongs to the enemy in us so that when he comes to us or comes for us like Jesus we can say he's found nothing in us hopefully this month we're going to share in all of the services particularly the midweek services and the love circle services how to gain mastery and victory over sin as I was dealing with this, the Lord told me to preach on a subject. And being an obedient servant of God, I'm going to follow him and obey him. I want to say, ladies and gentlemen, that it is impossible to live a life of purity, a life free from sin, if we don't understand the terror of the Lord. That is, that God is to be feared. I think in Genesis 20 or so, you can look for that scripture. When Abraham lied, of course, his sin, when he lied that his wife was his sister, when he was confronted, he said, I thought that the fear of the Lord was not in this place. So he felt, he said, paraphrasing, that I thought perhaps someone would kill me for my wife. Please, please look for that scripture and give them. What he's saying here is the degree to which the fear of the Lord is present in a life is the degree to which he will be sin free and the degree to which the terror and the fear of the Lord is far from a life, the degree to which they would sin. In fact, the Bible said, Jacob swore by the fear of Isaac, his father. He called God the fear of Isaac, his father. The fear of Isaac. Please give them the scriptures. So God is not only to be loved, God is to be feared. God is to be feared. And without the fear of the Lord, we may not be able to succeed in our fight against sin. The fear of the Lord. Incidentally, the fear of the Lord proceeds, ladies and gentlemen, yeah, we talk about love, the goodness of God, but the fear of the Lord proceeds from understanding God's judgmental prerogatives. That God is not just a father. God is a righteous judge. Hallelujah. I'll share a few thoughts with you as I go where I want to go today because I want to talk about hell. Incidentally, when I was preaching about it, God said I should preach on hell is real. And I began to think that, oh God, when was the last 
time, I thought, I even thought on the subject of hell. I said this, and I'm ashamed to say this, that it is a subject I may never have not thought on hell since the beginning of this ministry up until now. It is not a subject that you hear much about in our generation. The subject of hell or the fear of the Lord. Yes, we hear a lot about the goodness of God. Yes, there are a lot of songs about the love of God. That's why I think our generation is a spoiled generation. A generation that knows all about the goodness of God and nothing about the fear of God will be very cheap and very irresponsible in their, in their approach to serving the Lord. We, ladies and gentlemen, must fear God. I'll give you a few scriptures. In 2 Corinthians 5, verse 11, it says, Knowing therefore the terror, give them that scripture, of the Lord, we persuade men. Hmm. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Ha! Huh? Knowing therefore the terror of the law. In other words, God is to be feared. And he says, the reason why we are persuading men is because we are aware of the terror of the law. He said, but we are made manifest unto God. And I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. But Paul said, knowing therefore the terror of the law, we persuade men. Probably the reason why we are not persuading ourselves or persuading people to do right, to live right, to live clean, to live pure, is because we do not know the terror of the Lord. Listen to me. True, God is love, but God is to be feared. I'm reminded now of, 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 of the man of God, Moses, and how that because of one thing, God said to Moses, you're not crossing over. And when Moses tried to apply his intercessory skill to it, God said, speak to me no more of this matter. Speak to me no more of this matter. So a man who envisioned the promised land, received the mandate for the promised land, failed. And when you, when you studied the Bible, I think in the book of Deuteronomy, he said, because you failed to demonstrate, give them the NIV, you failed to demonstrate my holiness before the people. Hmm. Therefore, he said, you will not enter the promised land. So God is to be fair, knowing therefore the terror. This generation does not understand the terror of the law. Does not understand it. And it is reflective in our character, in our purity, in our lifestyle as believers. May God not serve a verdict on you. In Jesus' mighty name. The second thing you see in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 31, is that it says, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. It is a fearful thing, thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Now, it's not saying that anybody is perfect, but it's saying sincerely, <laughs> be afraid of falling into God's hand. Sometimes when I see the pride and the arrogance with which people speak in spite of their sin, when I see their pompousness, when I see their arrogance, when I see their defiance, sometimes I'm afraid to say, ah, hey, hey, what you should be crying and begging God to have mercy on you is because you don't know that it's a fearful thing. Not only is God a terror, it is a fearful thing to fall into his hands. The third thing you must understand in 2 Peter 2 verse 9, it says, Then our God knows how to deliver the godly out of temptation and to reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment. So God knows how to deliver the godly out of temptation. And then he now reserves the unjust under punishment. I know we don't like this. God does not punish. God, a God of love, cannot punish. There's a theologian there or a pastor in the U.S. who said a God of love can't send people to hell. Come on. Where did you get that from? 
So in order for us not to, you see, we know so much. Most of the songs about love, love, love. There's even one song there about, uh, I can't even, I don't know what one, let me not go into that. You listen to the songs and you're, you, you, uh, is it Jerry or Mother and Love or something? I can't even remember the song. When you're listening to the song, you're listening to Nairo, a very popular song. Check it. Any song that promotes, ah, God loves me, I do it trends because there's something about our generation that does not want to take responsibility for purity. They would rather bring God down to their level and call it grace and call it love. Hey, I know he's a God of grace. I know he's a God of love, but he's also a God to be feared. That is why I saw something in Romans 11, verse 22, 21, 22. He said, for if God did not spare the natural branches, talking about Israel, he may not spare you either, talking about us. He said, therefore, consider the goodness and the severity of the law. Can I say to our songwriters, we have not started writing songs. If all the songs we are singing about the goodness of God, he said, consider the goodness and the severity of the law. Nobody is forming perfect, but a perfect picture must be presented for people to be perfected. If we, pre I'll say that once again, nobody is perfect, but a perfect picture of God must be presented for people to be perfected. So look at that scripture. He said, therefore, consider the goodness and the severity of the law. Not just the goodness of the law alone. Not just the severity of the law alone. You need a comprehension and a consideration of both the goodness of God and the severity of God. Is God good? Yes, God is good. Is God severe? Yes, God is. If you enter God's trouble, <laughs> if God concludes on you now, on those who fail, now what is it? On those who fail, severity, but towards you, goodness, if you continue in his goodness. Are you seeing that scripture? He's saying there's a condition for his goodness. He said, on those who fail, severity, but towards you, goodness. But what's the condition? If you continue in his goodness. Otherwise, you also will be cut off. Look at that scripture. Powerful stuff. I will read it once again. He said, for if God did not spare the natural branches, those Israel, he may not spare you either. Therefore, as you build your Christian life, consider both the goodness and the severity of the law on those who fail severity, but towards you, goodness. If you continue in his goodness. So we should be striving to increase in goodness so that God will continue to be good. He now says, otherwise, you also will be cut off. The way I look at it now, my wife may tell you, for instance, I am the most loving husband in the world. Ask her. Ah, ah I love. I, I know I love. I know I love. Oh. But if you think that I am just a lover, you will get into trouble fast. Are you there? The goodness of God, the love of God, and the severity of God is perfectly mixed in me. Perfectly. His severity and his gravity and his goodness. Perfect mix. Imagine someone has said, ah, that pastor is... I mean, I, I mean, somebody was in our house and then... I think one of the, uh, the support staff in the house was telling my wife that, oh, that is so nice. That is so nice. My wife said, really? <laughs> my wife laughed. I said, yeah, it's nice. But he said, daddy, ah, that, my wife said she's also laughing at the person. That someone else has said to her, uh, it's nice, but the lady was arguing with them. My wife just laughed and left. That's the same way it is with God. You need a path of him. My fear in our generation is that somehow some attributes of God has been emphasized to the detriment of other attributes and it is reflecting in the character of our people. People for instance now can indulge in sin and not even think of repenting. They can indulge in sin and not even and still be forming right 
in the place of sin. Things that people should be hiding about. Things that people should be sorry about. Things that people should be weeping about. Things that people should be grieving about. Things that people should be, should be, should be, should be set down about. You see them in it and still braggadocious because they don't understand God. Once again, consider the goodness and the severity of the law. He said, on those who fail severity, but towards you, goodness, if you continue in the goodness. Otherwise, he says, you also will be caught. That's what, there's nothing like one saved forever saved. You have, to, you have to give all diligence to make your calling and your election sure. Are you getting what I'm saying? So, here I want to share with you on the severity of God as I share a few things about the reality of hell. So, whoever said that God is too loving to send this creature to hell does not understand the Bible. It may be an American and I'm an American because everything like positive vibes only, positive vibes only. Eh, to the point now where you, you tell people now that they are wrong, they feel that you are being negative. Hey, if you are wrong, you are wrong. Forget about positive vibes. What do you mean by positive vibes only? Is the only positive, like, it's not positive and negative that provides electricity? Can just a positive wire alone? Are you there? What's this obsession with positivity in our generation that people, are you getting what I'm saying? We must understand that God, <laughs> hey, hey, hey. let me just keep quiet. Before people are falling like flies, let us address this thing. And re realize, I'll share this probably later about time. Look, the state in which you die is the state in which you, you, you get my way. Look, yeah, yeah, the state of your death will determine the state of your eternity. So don't be there saying, uh, <laughs> the state in which you die. Somebody said, you can't sleep in Delilah's bosom and wake up. You can't sleep in Delilah's laps and wake up in Abraham's bosom. You are deceiving yourself. Please, let's wake up. Please, let's wake up. Please, whoever is deceiving us, let's wake up. Hmm. So here, the reality of hell. So let's talk about hell a little bit. I want to use this by the grace of God though, to paint a vivid picture. Ten things. Every, it may be the first message you are hearing on hell in your lifetime and you are at something years. You know, and that's why you see the character of that older generation. Their Christianity, you know, their character. Because they grew up on books like, like Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God <laughs> by Jonathan Edwards. Books like a, revel a Divine Revelation of Hell. These are books that nobody is carrying motivational books around town. You get my point? Those were books, books like Fox Book of Matthias. Those were books, books that this generation knows nothing about. They'll tell you the book is boring. <laughs> you will not go to hell. You will not go to hell in Jesus' mighty name. So please, in the name of the Lord, I have a covenant with God. The church is not mine. Whatever he says, if you know how much I wrestle this message, he said you must teach it. You must teach it. You must teach it. So please let me paint a vivid picture of hell to you. And then at the end of it, you make your decision where you want to go. Either heaven or hell. But we have told you that the God loves you too much to send you hell. Light. Let's press on. Let's begin with the nature of hell. Number one, hell is a place of everlasting fire. Not that uh, there's no air conditioning. A place of everlasting fire. Matthew chapter 18 verse 6 to verse 9. It says... But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it will be better for him if a milestone were hung around his neck and he were drowned in the depth of the sea. Now, let me explain what he's He's saying sincerely, do your best not to be the reason for another person's sin, particularly a little one. Do your best. He's saying, if you are the reason of sin, the stimulator of sin, the origin of sin, the enabler of sin in the life of God's little one, it is as if now he says here, a millstone will be tied on your head and you are dropped. That's, he's saying basically that sincerely, if you don't, if you keep enabling sin 
in the lives of people, you are going to go down. You're going to go down. Imagine letting them tie something you and throw you. There's no way you're going. And that's why many are going down. Let me say this very quickly. No matter what your struggles are, always maintain the standard of truth and aspire to it. Always maintain the standard of truth and aspire to it. And do your best not to be. I mean, sometimes you are telling people who don't dress like this. If you, because of your dressing, somebody goes down, you are going down. That's what I said here. You are going down. And that's why some people are sinking. They don't know. Hey, I have to be free. I have to be, hey, the world was not designed for your freedom. Are you getting what I'm saying here? You have to consider the influence of every action, every word, every decision, every behavior, every appearance, and what that will do in the life of somebody who may not be at the level of strength. And that's why Paul at some point said, if meat will make my brother stumble, I'm not going to touch it. That's, he reflects his, that's maturity. Where the limits of your actions are determined by the conscience of other people. And that you don't want to be the reason why anybody falls. Now, see what now said. He says, woe to the world because of offenses. For offenses must come, but woe to the man through whom the offense comes. Are you seeing that? If your hand of food causes you to sin, cut it off. Cast it off from you. It is better for you to enter into life lame or maimed rather than having two hands and two feet to be cast into, on the line that you have, everlasting fire. Please put my notes online. Everlasting fire. And if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. It is better for you to enter into life with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into hellfire notice that he's calling it everlasting fire if you are there you are there forever are you getting what i'm saying if you are there it's a fire forever imagine some of you know you've put your hand into fire a little bit now you've tried it just burning for a second now imagine you, you are burning forever <laughs> And let me do it. So, number one, it's a place of everlasting fire. Listen to me. I pray that God will give you a personal revelation of hell. That when you sleep tonight, you will have a dream. Because sincerely, nobody has a genuine revelation of hell and not change their behavior. Nobody has a genuine, nobody. It will make you reevaluate your Christianity. And that's why sometimes if you see yourself wallowing in unnecessary things, you know, go and look for some things preached by people like like john hagee you go and look at those things and then you sit down and watch and introduce the fear of god into your spirit once you see carnality creeping over <laughs> to you the second thing about hell write this down is that hell is a place of eternal sorrow second samuel 22 and verse 6 the sorrow of hell compassed me about the snares of death pray pray and it's in different places scripture is a place of sorrow you know when i was in the world you know and they were preaching to me in those days i used to be a a, a club guy and a call guy and they say you go to i say another hell i want to go fella day dear and i've mentioned all the bad bad people in this world snoop dog go day dear heaven go boring you know i said things like that. heaven go boring hell nine go day well if fella is in hell fella is not dancing there neither is he singing there Listen to me. It's a place of sorrow. There's nothing to be excited about there. Take it from me. So number two, hell is a place of eternal sorrow. Number three, Matthew 23, 23 says, Ye serpents, you generation of vipers, how can you escape the damnation of hell? So number three, hmm, hell is a place of eternal damnation. As far as our Bible is concerned, there is no hope after getting there. There is no, look, there's no looking forward to anything after getting there. Once you are going there, one of my mentors, and that's why I listen to my fathers. Somebody accused one of my fathers of, of being in a cult, you know, and he sat down with me and he was eating breakfast with me and he said, what are you telling me, Pastor Deji? Because Pastor Kredi Kumaya, what are you telling me? He said, you mean we'll save souls like this, do all of these things on the earth and go to hell? He said, I don't want part of I was, I, I was just looking at him like this. The way he was talking about hell, I mean, I was afraid. 
He said, you mean I'll do all of these things on earth, be a pastor on earth, do save souls on earth, build churches on earth, then end up in hell? He said, Deji, me offer, me offer, me offer. Ah, Rabba Katawaye. In other words, I saw there that here were men that were living with eternity in view. Saying that no matter what, are you saying because of money, because of what, I'm going to sell my soul and go to hell? That's what he was saying. And he said, it's not worth it. I left that place thinking, realizing therefore that you can do all these things. You can serve in Austria and go to hell. You can be a minister and go to hell. You can be a pastor and go to hell. You don't get, you can be usher, a, a choir. You can be entrumment, you can be entrumment assembly certified and go to certified hell. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> if you don't change, that's what I'm saying. It's a place of eternal damnation. You get there, there's no hope. There's no repentance there. There's no repentance there. And this thing about this rapture they're talking about, it will happen in a moment. He said, in a moment, we shall all be changed. It's not that like it will be ready. You, if you are not living ready, you will not be ready. It's a place of eternal damnation. May God spare us from it in Jesus' mighty name. The fourth thing about hell, write this down. Hell is a place of the destruction of the body and the soul. In Matthew 10, verse 20, he said, And fear not them who can kill the body. He said, But be, but are not able to kill the soul. He said, But fear him, brother, who is able to destroy both body and soul in hell. Have you seen that? Allah In the final days of my dad, my dad's life, I saw him in agony. I saw him uh, like uh, agony like I had never. I have the videos and I have the pictures. Blood. He, he, he was having the stroke, concussions, contortions in his face. Blood coming out from his brain to his mouth. Blood coming out from his, 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 his inside to his mouth. His teeth was red. And per second, he was jacking. I was looking at him suffer in the flesh. Imagine, for instance, now for a man to suffer like that in the final hours only to die for his soul to continue suffering at a point my only relief was that let this man enough of all this let him go and rest but imagine not being in christ and then you suffer on earth only to wake up to eternity to continue suffering man let's be thinking let's be thinking there is more to this world than this world. Something created our world. And after this world, they, and listen, the afterlife is longer than this life. Okay, Max, you fulfill the 120 years. Eternity is still eternity times longer than 120 years. He says, so fear him. Not only who can kill the body, but then who can destroy both body and soul in hell. Let me ask you a question. Where is the destination of your soul? You are living now for the body. You are where's the destination of your soul? If you die today, where's your soul going? These are questions you must ask yourselves. I'm telling you, some life can be hard, but I'm telling you, if you don't die in Christ, eh? <laughs> your life after death will be harder. That's what he's saying here. That's what he's saying here. In fact, in, in Luke 12, he says, and I say to you, my friends, don't be afraid of those who can kill the body. And after that have no more that they can do. But I will show you whom you should fear. Fear God, fear him, who after he has killed, has power to cast into hell. Yes, I say to you, fear him. So hell is a place of destruction, both for the body and soul, not just the body, body and soul. I think, Pastor Joy, I, I think, Pastor Joy should you get us a book for this month, the book for this month, A Revelation of Hell by Mary Baxter. A Revelation. Maybe put the book out there. A Revelation of Hell. I need maybe like a hundred copies you put it there. And all of us should read because you need it. You need a revelation, a personal revelation of hell to regulate your behavior, to regulate your actions on the air. Because if you go there, man, it won't be funny. Number five, still talking about hell. <laughs> In Habakkuk 2.5, I saw something that was very, very, very scary. 
How about two, two five? He said, what to the wicked? Indeed, because he transgresses by wine, he is a proud man and does not stay at home. Is that like you? Let's press on. Because he enlarges his desire as hell and he is like death and cannot be satisfied. Listen to me. Hell has an enlarged, that's number four, five. Hell is a place of enlarged and insatiable desire for man. Look at what he said. He says, and he's like death that cannot be satisfied. He gathers to himself all nations and heaps up for himself all peoples. In other words, what he's saying there about hell, it's a place of enlarged and insatiable desire for peoples and nations. For peoples and nations. What you're looking at online, go and check the music. Look at Instagram. Look at what is happening. There is an enlarged cup. The gate of hell is wide open. Enlarged, insatiable desire for people and for nations. For people and for nations. If you are not conscious, he's after us. He's after pastors. He's after leaders. He's after husbands. He's after wives. He's after... He, Satan will love it so much. And Satan is a long-term planner. He will love it so much for you to begin well and end poorly. Enlarge desire. In, in, and insatiable. Insatiable. He says, and he gathers to himself. He's using music to gather. He's using music to gather. He's using apps to gather. He's using all, to gather nations and people. Heaps for himself. All nations and people. You must understand. Hallelujah. When hell is coming out for you, Alemurian, Sometimes you must see, you must understand the source of some of the temptations you are facing. A cycle, a sick is as if Satan is calling for. There are some of you on some Satan is after you. You you are changing location. The temptation is there. You are changing place. The temptation, the same drive for you. I love what Jesus prayed over us. He said, Satan has desire to sift you. As wheat. He desires to you. He said, but I prayed for you. That your faith do not fail. I know what he's talking about. Sometimes, I, sometimes as a leader, you just know that hell is gunning for you. Pulling for you. Doing everything within his power to drag you into itself. And you must not agree. Oh my God. It's a place of enlarged and insatiable desire for peoples and nations. That's where that pressure is coming from. That's where that temptation is coming from. That's where that drive is coming from. That's where that inability to hold yourself is coming from. It's an insatiable desire. Enlarged. I like Isaiah. Watch this. Where did my glory go? I'll show you. Isaiah 5, verse 13. See, see. Hell consumes glory. Give me Isaiah 5. He said, therefore my people are gone into captivity because they have no knowledge. And their honorable men are famished. Their multitude are dried up with tests. Therefore, hell again has enlarged itself. Are you there? And opened its mouth without measure. And their glory, and their multitude, and their pomp, and he that rejoices shall descend into it. Their glory descend, their pomp descend into it. It has enlarged itself. By the way, here you see the secret of enlarging yourself. Open your mouth without measure. That's it. Hell has enlarged itself and opened his mouth without measure. So when you want to enlarge yourself, you start opening your mouth without measure. But that's not what I'm talking about today. And that's how you see the mouth of hell. You look at TV, you see the mouth of hell. You look at music, you see the mouth. You look at apps, you see the mouth of hell. You post truth, you need to, you need to promote truth for it to trend. You post trash, they help you promote it. Hell has opened his mouth. Opened its mouth. And as it opens his mouth, it consumes their glory. It consumes their multitude. It consumes their, and the one that is just jollying, the one that is rejoicing, thinking that life is a joke. Some are just there, they don't even understand. They look at clothes, they can't see, they can't see hell in the, in the fashion. You are looking at the clothes, you can't see hell's creativity in the fashion. You can't see this creativity on the pit of hell. You as a Christian, you carry, you wear it, and you start advertising hell around town. People tell you you are sexy because you understand that you represent a distinct kingdom. 
You are born again, but your clothes is not born again. You are born again, but your fashion is not born again. You are so dead to the conflict between kingdoms. There are many in the kingdom of God working for the other kingdom, and they don't know it. So hell. <laughs> let me show you a scripture. And that's why let me explain this. The church must keep going out. Because in Psalms 70, 27 verse 20, he said, Hell and destruction are never full. Are never full. So the eyes of the man are never set. So there is always room in hell. There is always room. So if there is always room in hell, why should we be quiet? Why should the church? Are you getting what I'm saying? Imagine a church that a hell is in there's room, there's room, there's more room, there's more room. Let's take more. Let's take the let's take the young, let's take husband, let's take wives, let's take members. Let, hell is so excited. There's more always room. His room is never full. When I say our church, which what are you telling me about this? The next few weeks and all that we are moving to our move for another seven weeks. I intend to double our church in seven weeks. Wherever they will sit and they will sit down there. We are not waiting to get to the other place anymore. We will start growing where we are. Where hell, hell has room. Check it now. Hell has room, room. Come, come as you are. Come, 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 come young. You are looking at cartoons. They are showing cartoons. Men and men kissing. They are in cartoon. Hell, 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 hell. Moving into music. Moving into music. Even in education. There's always room. Never full. As anybody who's telling that we are growing or not, it doesn't know what you're talking about. Number six, because of time, hell is a place of unquenchable fire and undying worms. You see that in Mark chapter 9. Verse 42 and verse 48. <laughs> the worms, the, the, <laughs> the, the, the fire is unquenchable. The worms are undying. Not that you can kill it. Not that cockroach you kill cockroach. No, this one is unkillable. Coming through your nose, coming through your eyes. Coming, what are you telling me here? You still, and to tell you what dangerous hell is, I'll share with that. You still sustain your sensation in hell. You still, you still feel the tests, but not be able to quench it. Come and say something. Matthew he says, but whoever causes Matthew chapter, Mark chapter 9, verse 40, he said, Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it will be better for him if a millstone don't cause anybody to stumble, will hung around his neck and he was thrown into the sea. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter into life maimed rather than having two hands to go to hell into fire that shall never be quenched. Where the worms die not, and the fire is not quenched. Say that with me. Where the worms die not, <laughs> and the fire is not quenched. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame, rather than having two feet to be cast into hell, into fire, that shall never be quenched. Again, repeat the second time. Where the worms does not die, and the fire is not quenched. Number three now says, if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. It is better for you to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into hellfire. Again, three times for establishment. Where the worms die not and where the fire is not quenched. So hell is a place of unquenchable fire and undying worms. Namo robo dobalia. Holy Ghost, burn it into our consciousness. Like never before. Show us, oh God, the fiery furnaces of the enemy. You see the same thing in Isaiah chapter 14, verse 9. Let me just press on to verse 12. You can read there. Hell from beneath is moved for you to meet you at your coming. <laughs> it's tears of the dead for you, even all the chief ones of the earth. It has raised up. For from their thrones of all kings and all they that speak say unto you are you also become weak are you become like unto us your pump is brought down to the grave the noise of your vows the worm is spread under you and the worms cover you you see that scripture the worms are under the worms cover you how are you falling oh lucifer he is there he wants you there i'll explain that later he doesn't want to go alone. That's why Satan, he's come down. He has missed it. He's not having great wrath so that you too will miss it. Let me explain it. You know, those of us who have succeeded, all we are talking is how can we get other people to succeed? Those that have failed too, that's what they are talking to get other people to fail. Because sincerely, success and failure is not sweet alone. <laughs> and that's why you see us. And for me now, I'm being more blessed by the year, more and more blessed. I'm wanting more and more people blessed. 
So I'll be talking about what I'm doing to get other people. The same way, those who have missed it, I'll be talking, talking, talking to get other people to miss it like them so that they will have company in their misery. Misery is sweet if you have company. And that's what you're seeing in Satan here. But he says, under you there are worms. Over you there are worms. Even he, and he wants you there with him. Number seven, hell is a place of eternal torment. Eternal torment and test. You see that in Luke chapter 16, verse 22. To verse 7. So it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And being in torment in hell, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. I do even like that one because if you are in hell, you should not be able to see. He was in torment, but you could see somebody living like, you get my point. It's not good sometimes. You are not doing well. You're not somebody else doing well. Look at what happened. Then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus that he may dip a tip, just a tip of his finger in water. That's test, unquenchable. And cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things. And likewise, Lazarus, evil things. But now he is comforted and you are tormented. Besides, watch this. Ali Moses, yeah, work for the salvation of your family. He said, and besides all this, between us and you, there is a gulf. So that those who want to come <laughs> to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. Are you seeing the gulf? You can't cross over. The only place where you can cross over is now in accepting our Lord Jesus Christ. And living for him on the earth. Being wrong, you repent. And seek to do better. You can't cross over over there. Once you get there, you are there. He says, then he said, I beg you therefore, Father. You will send me to my father. Send him to my father's house. For I have, <laughs> I have five brothers who are living in sin like me. That he may testify to them. Lest they also come to this place of torment. And Abraham said to him, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, no, Father, Abraham, but if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said to him, if they don't hear the word, neither will they be persuaded if somebody else rises from the dead. A place of eternal torment. Let me press on because of time. Number eight, hell is a place of corruption. Acts chapter 2 verse 27. For you will not leave my soul in hell, nor will you allow your holy one see corruption. Are you seeing there? A place of corruption. It's the same thing in Acts chapter 2 verse 31. A place of corruption. Nothing works there. Nine, hell is a place deep beneath you said that job, job 11 19 as it is high as it is as high as heaven what can you do deeper than hell who can know it psalms 15 25 the way of life is above to the wise you may depart from hell beneath understand this you are resonating with hell you are going down you resonate with heaven you are going up you resonate with hell hell is beneath Heaven is above. You resonate with heaven, you are going up. You resonate with hell, you are going down. So I need these pictures to stay with you as long as you live. And you begin to take your life more seriously in the name of the Lord Jesus. As for me, I would have told you that these realities exist. Lastly, before I preach to you next time, hell was not designed for man. Matthew chapter 25, verse 41. He says, then he shall say unto them, on the left hand, depart from me, you cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. In other words, God did not design hell, lastly, for man, for you or for myself. God designed hell. God designed hell for the devil and his angels. I'm saying today, don't let a life of sin take you there with them. 
Hell was designed for the devil and his angels. Don't let a life of iniquity and sin take you there. In my next time with you, as God gives me the privilege, I will share with you why do, if hell was not designed for man, why do people go there? Why do they go there? And I pray that in the name of the Lord Jesus, you will not go there. Your children will not go there. No member of the Truman Assembly will go there. Grace to turn be granted to us. Grace to take responsibility for a righteous life, a pure life, a holy life. Let that grace rest upon right now. In Jesus' mighty name. As I close these three days of glory, I want us to pray and come before the Lord with humility. If there be any hidden sin in your life, can you repent? And say, Lord, I confess. I repent. He said, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all righteousness. But if we say we have not sinned, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess, he's faithful and just. Can we confess our secret sins, our hidden sins? Can we confess and come back to him? Can we put a check? Can we put a stop in the name of the Lord Jesus? Father, you said your people who are called by your name humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways. You say you will heal their land. I'm asking, oh God, that the grace to turn will be given to every leader, member, and partner of the enthronement assembly, that they will begin to consider their eternity in every day they live right now. In the name of Jesus, Lord, I'm asking that beyond what I've shared today, burn this revelation into their consciousness. In the name of the Lord Jesus, we give you thanks and praise. In Jesus' mighty name. You're there, you're saying, I need to give my life to Christ. You have to. You have to. Just say with me, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that God raised you from the dead. Therefore, right now, I'm saved. I'm born again. All I'm saying these three days, it's our season of exceeding glory. But the only thing that makes men fall short of that glory is sin. It is time, ladies and gentlemen, for us to be aspire to boundless glory as we subscribe to a sinless life. As God gives me the grace to be on ground, I will develop and open one or two things to you that can give you victory. I pray that you will operate in the exceeding glory. I pray that every record you have set for yourself this year and this month, you will break it in the name of the Lord Jesus. Can we partake of the communion tonight? As we partake of the communion, we are saying, Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus, let the life of dead swallow every sin tendency in us. That this month will be for us a month of victory. You know what that thing is. What the Bible calls easily besetting sin. You're saying by this communion, let that sin be judged in the name of the Lord Jesus. Thank you, Heavenly Father. In Jesus' mighty name. In Jesus' precious name we are praying. I command the mercy of the Lord to prevail over your life, over your past, over your present, and over your future. And I pray that in the name of Jesus, you will not go there. I've described it in the name of Jesus. These words will not stand against you in the final day. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. God bless you. Good night. Brace up for Maximum Impact 2022 this Sunday. It's two power-packed services at the Enthronement Assembly Lagos as we host God's servant, Pastor Ron Amotunde. Date is April 10, 2022. Time, 7.30 a.m. first service, 9 a.m. second service. Venue, the Neka House, Plot A2, Hakim Balogu Way, off Agidingbi, Keja. Your hosts are Reverend Deji and Dr. Sho Olabode. Come along with a friend. Enthronement Assembly, Assembly, activating and, and actualizing God's, God's royalty, royalty in you. The Enthronement Assembly presents the Excellence in Life Service, 
Join us every Sunday by 7.30 a.m. for God's new mandate to birth excellence in key areas of our lives. Anticipate professional roundtables where experts in different professions address issues in their field of expertise and find out how to make your way to living an excellent life in 2022. Venue is Necker House, Plot A2 Akim Balogunwe, off Agidingbi, Ikeja. Your hosts are Reverend Deji and Dr. Shem Olabode, the Excellence in Life Services. Be there.